Hello, friends. This is Darren Hayes of PigskinDispatch.com. Before we take you to your favorite Sports History Network show, just want to tell you a little bit about some merch that you can pick up that represents your favorite SHN podcast. So far, there's t-shirts, coffee mugs, and even books from some of the authors that do podcasts right here on SHN. Who could buy something better than that than have the history right from the, the gentleman that you hear talking about it? But we also are adding things each and every day. And where's that store, may you ask? Well, it's at SportsHistoryNetwork.com. Up at the top, there is the SHN. HN merch button. Click on that. It'll take you right to the store and you can be representing your favorite podcast and show the world that, hey, on the swag that I'm using, it's the headquarters of sports yesteryear, Sports History Network, and my favorite podcaster, the Sports History Network store. Shop there today. Podcast number four here on the PFRA podcast as part of the Sports History Network. And George and I have the pleasure to be joined by the son of a former great Hall of Famer who, in his time when he left the league, led his category in a number of uh, statistical ones, and that's Don Maynard, uh, his son Scott Maynard, going to join us on the PFRA podcast. Tell the stories of Don, tell the stories of uh, time spent with Joe Namath and so many different things. Uh, we found him on Facebook. We were able to track him down and carve out about 45 minutes of time to chat with him on the PFRA podcast. And he got the chance to tell his stories in coaching, his stories in football, and the great stories about his dad as well. So George and I are joined next on the PFRA podcast as part of the Sports History Network by Scott Maynard. Pleased to be joined now on the uh, Professional Football Researchers Association podcast by Scott Maynard. And if that last name sounds familiar, it should for many of you uh, football fans that are listening to this because Scott is the son of Don Maynard, the former New York Jets uh, great wide receiver from yesteryear, I guess you could say. And uh, George and I are so pleased uh, to be joined by uh, Scott here on the show and have him on the podcast and relive some of the memories of his football career along with uh, talking about his, his father's Hall of Fame football career as well. Scott, thanks for joining us. Well, thank you. I'm, I'm glad to be on and uh, looking forward to talking about some stuff. And it's Dad's one-year anniversary, so uh, uh, this is good timing. So let's start first with, with a little bit about you, Scott, um, so that people kind of get to know you. I mean, obviously, I think a lot of people know your dad, but I mean, you have had quite the career in football yourself, and and I I think it's interesting some of the stops you've had along the way, but tell people a little bit about you, about kind of your career in football, and um, I guess what it was like growing up in the household of of a future Hall of Famer. Well, it, uh, you know, for me, it started at a very young age, and uh, yeah, I was totally blessed uh for uh just all the people I've met over the years and the uh in the places I've got to go and travel and uh, everything from work in sports camps Joe Namath sport football camp Jay Novacek football camp um done things <clears throat> playing ball just I started off at uh, Texas Tech and then went to UTEP and then, uh, and then I just kind of got into it and stayed into it. And then I wanted to get into coaching. And my senior year, I got injured, and one of my coaches got a head job at a Division two school, Eastern New Mexico, and said, uh, "Hey, Scott, come on, I need somebody to coach quarterbacks and receivers in the passing game." And that's when it just it really just flourished right there. That's when I knew where I was going, you know. Yeah. Yeah, I mean that's that's pretty cool for you and and you did tell me before when when we were talking about having you on that you actually um had some tryouts in different camps and and signed some time with a couple of different NFL rosters, didn't you? Yeah, and then uh there was a time period right there after I coached for about 2 years that I got myself in shape and some scouts would come to the school and look at some players. And they'd end up watching me, and I'd be out there running routes and catching balls. And they're like, oh, my gosh, you know, hey, you, we we want to bring you to a training camp or actually a tryout free agent camp. 
And so uh, that kind of started with the 49ers. And then after a couple trips to uh, tryout camps, they signed me for the 87 year uh, to go to training camp there. And that was just, it was a great experience. I mean, Jerry Rice was in his second year, John Taylor his first year. But, but just to learn from professionals in that organization uh, at my very beginning, my first really tryout and uh, our signed contract, I should say. I remember when my contract came in the mail and I got it and I had a signing bonus and the check was 15000 and Dad was like, oh, my gosh, Scott, are you kidding? I go, no, sir. And uh, he, we, he walked me out in one of his old sheds there. And he had an old filing cabinet and pulled out a, a deal there. And he goes, look at this check, copy of a check. And it was for 7500 And that was from the Giants, the New York Giants. Well, I'm sorry, his contract. Well, th- that was for the season. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. 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 yeah, so that was, I mean, that was cool, but... You know, it was just very special, uh, you know, going to, uh, of course, camp with the Niners and then the Cardinals the next year with Gene Stallings. He was the head coach. Um, And just to learn some great football. Um, You know, I saw some a lot of talented guys, and I was definitely a dark horse or a long shot. Um, But, gosh, in today's deal, I I definitely would have had a chance because they keep, like, four, five, six receivers, and they like those smart possession guys. And that's, you know, how I was at San Fran. Uh, but that was the time where they were changing between a bigger receiver to smaller, quicker ones, faster ones. Uh, there was a whole big change in the receiver position. Uh, what, was, yeah. but, what was it like working with Bill Walsh and Joe Montana? Oh, that was, that was just, I mean, incredible. Just it, Walsh was – Pinpoint a hundred percent perfectionist on 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 everything, whether it was coming out of the huddle, um, just your alignment. I mean, just everything was crisp. Uh, the play just got ran over and over and over till it was just executed flawless. I mean, I remember sometimes you'd be out there and it's like, okay, we just ran the same route. I mean, uh, for a twenty minute period. But we were we were running that pattern against every type of coverage, front zone blitz, uh, combo coverages. Just we were going to get good at one play and and execute it. And that's where the execution comes in uh, because that that's kind of how the Jets were. The, the Jets ran n- not a lot of plays, but they executed them very well. That seemed to be a common trait with coaches because I know that was a trait of, the, of Lombardi is they had, you know, a few plays in the prayer book, but they ran them over and over and over again, and they just out-executed you. Yeah, exactly. Nowadays, I mean, these guys got bifolders and four pages and, oh, my gosh, and wristbands, and it's like, wow. And I'm, like, going this whole time. If you can't remember the stuff in your head, you, you got to go back or simplify or something. If a coach needs all this stuff to call a game plan, um, <laughs> but I know there's a lot more info out there with computers. <laughs> well, and, and, and wasn't that kind of the, the brilliance, and I guess focusing on, on Bill Walsh here a bit for the second, wasn't that kind of the brilliance of him that, like, he did kind of simplify the game while at the same time changing the game? I mean, I'm sure you being in that offense, like, it was, it was kind of West Coast at its, at its finest, but you guys did it better than anybody when you were there. So that had to be cool kind of being there as that was kind of taking over the realm of the NFL, wasn't it? Well, and yeah, and especially for a, for a, a, a coach or a young coach, uh, myself, knowing that's what I was going to be down the road. And I, I took everything in. I mean, I took notes. I, I mean, I just, I, I was like, he was like a clinic. I mean, I was I was there, yeah, you know, like I said, when you're a long shot and you know you are, but you know where your future is going into coaching, it was just a great experience. And to learn that from, from that great staff, and that was wonderful. And then, and then after that, I got released, picked up Cardinals, and then I end up in Canada 
and I go up there because uh, one of my college teammates, Sammy Garza, uh, he was up there, and he goes, and we used to always train all in the summers, and then actually we were together with the Cardinals and trained for six months and off season and two days and all that stuff. And we got a great relationship. And then he goes, Scott, you need to come up here. You you make it up here. And so I ended up getting a tryout with uh, with Winnipeg. And and I I had a uh, oh gosh a herniated disc and uh, and pulled my glute muscle, and that was it. And uh, and that's where it just kind of started too. And I went in. And I talked to Cal Murphy, and Mike Riley was the head coach at the time who was coached in the NFL and college. And, and I said, hey, I, I really want to get into, you know, coaching. And I did coach, and I know I could help you guys. And the staff's up there, like four coaches, that was it. And so the, the offense had a, a basically a backfield coach. That's quarterbacks, receivers, and running backs. And they had an O-line coach. That was it. And then on defense, they got like three coaches. They got secondary linebackers and D-line. And then you had your head coach, and that was your staff. And so, uh, yeah, it worked out where they said, you know what, we could use Scott, and he could help with special teams. And that's where I really got into coaching. And then it just it just took off, and we ended up winning the Grey Cup that year. And and it was just fabulous. And, and then I ended up staying up in the CFL for about eight eight years. Uh, then came back and got back into college ball, Idaho State, University of South Dakota, and then the arena ball. I got into that. Oh, I did that for about eight, nine years. And I, I got on with John Gregory uh, with the New York Dragons and his the Iowa Barnstormers. He's the one that coached Kurt Warner, had Kurt Warner. And, uh, and that was a great experience. Go to Arizona, I'm with Danny White. And so I'm learning from the best again. And just, you know, I just really had a great time. When you were in the uh, CFL, you also, uh, I read Coach Briefly at Toronto with uh, Mouse Davis. Oh, yeah. And that's another guy, you know, just on my resume of guys I got to meet and and associate with. Uh, Mouse was incredible, the run and shoot. Um, We had a lot of fun. Um, he, he's just, he, oh gosh, he's a great guy. And the personalities in coaching, I, I've met some Hall of Fame players through my dad and going to the golf tournaments and hanging out with these guys. I, I mean, going to the Super Bowl of golf and getting to play, like with Bobby Bell, we actually won it one year in Florida, Miami. Um, but just going to a lot of those type of events um, was just, uh, I, I mean, my life has just been crazy, crazy fun. And just for a kid that loves, you know, football, um, it was just really special. And I saw also you you were actually head coach uh, one year with the uh, Laredo Law in the Arena League. Yeah. Yeah, matter of fact, I, I got that kind of through Mouse Davis. Mouse coached with the Houston Gamblers, and there was a guy there, Kiki D. Ayala, He's actually Texas's all-time, you know, tackler um, linebacker. He's right up there with Tommy Nobis, and and so uh, Kiki talked to Mouse, and Mouse gave him my number, and uh, and I went out there and just, a brand new. And, and actually, at that time, I was I had like seven job offers. I mean, seven. And I'm like, okay, I did my checks and minuses, plus minuses. Where am I going? And I just, I really didn't know. And then the thing about Laredo, even though it was arena football, I had other jobs, college, um, back to the CFL, but in total about seven places I could have gone. And I chose um, Laredo because I, I got to be the very first, start the franchise from the beginning not only as the coach, but the general manager, the, the the builder, the equipment guy. I mean, I I found the colors, the team colors, the logo, um, helped ticket sales, ordered the turf, ordered the equipment, hired me equipment man. Uh, you know, it helped with the uh, 
the, the music in the arena, you know, during the halftime, it's like they were just, they were all brand new, virgins. They didn't have a clue about the game and putting on a show. And I got to run the whole thing. Wow. Wow. That's, you, were doing it, you were doing it all. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's, that's, that's really cool that, that you got to experience that like that and, and kind of work it from the ground up. And, and I did want to ask you and kind of go back because I, I think it's interesting your life that it, it, you know, you almost came out of the womb destined to be a part of football. I mean, your dad is Don Maynard. He's, he's a great wide receiver of all time. He's a Hall of Famer. Some would be, you know, would, would probably put him on, on greatest of all time when it comes to wide receivers. There's a lot of people that he would be the greatest for them. Um, for you being born into that, when was the point though that that Scott Maynard realized that he loved football? Because I mean, obviously, as I said, it was kind of bred into you from being part of the family and with your dad being Don. But when did you realize, Scott? Was it when you were a young kid? Was it when you were in high school? Was it when you were in college? Was it the first time you saw Joe Namath throw a pass to your dad? When did you realize that you loved football? You know that uh, nobody's ever asked me that question. And and I think it's a a great great question because it it all started for me so young, uh, even playing in my backyard with my German Shepherd, and I'd put on my little Hutch little league uniform when I was like you know eight nine years old, and him tackling me <laughs> and going to different things in high school. But I I I. I the way Dad brought me up, it, it was about everything. It was all about other things in life, um, horses and golf and work and mowing yards and carrying somebody's groceries and and doing all this stuff. So in high school and grade school, and, of course, he, he just got out and retired, and things weren't crazy like they are now. And and they just knew my dad as, you know, hey, Mr. Maynard, how you doing? He wore cowboy boots and jeans, and, you know, there was no flaunting or showboating or anything, and it was just, I was happy, to, and he taught me it was a team game, and it's about the relationships on that field and and not to be a selfish player and things like that. And, and so I, I didn't really, as a younger and even in college, I enjoyed it more. I wasn't the guy that was grunting and, you know, all pissed off and this and that. I was like, hey, it's a game. God has blessed me to be able to play this and have fun and have great relationships. And sure, it's about winning too. But it it, it didn't really take effect, and especially who my father was. I still, I saw highlight films, things like that. But, you know, uh, they they didn't show it like they do now. But then I got to Eastern, and that's when I knew when before I left, Dad gave me crates full of films. And the thing is, these things were 16 millimeter, and the the college I went and coached at, that first year I coached, actually quite a few years, is I, I got to coach and enjoy 16 millimeter films and do the film breakdowns and the clips and, and making highlights and stuff like that. But Andy gave me the playbook, and we'd sit down, and he would draw up the play, and then we would put it on the film. He goes, Scott, this is this. This is 71, or this is the, the slide, or the sprint route, or the KC. And he would show it to me on film, and then I got to see his actual game film footage not these highlights, because the AFL did a lot of things in slow motion, slow time. So a lot of people think, oh, these guys weren't very fast. It's like, you know what? You, you see Maynard and Allworth going full speed in the real film? These guys were cats. I mean, they were so fast. But that's when I just loved it, watching the game and then just starting to learn right there. That's, that's when it happened. Well, and I, I know George actually looked up to uh, about your dad and about his speed. And I don't know, George, if you wanted to ask about this, but I mean, they go go ahead, George. Yeah, they. I I, I thought it was interesting. I, I I listened to an interview that your dad did, and uh, you know, he basically said nobody ever caught him from behind. You know, he said that he felt that he was the fastest at the time that he was uh, in the league, and actually, 
he originally came up, you mentioned sort of in passing the Giants, he originally came up with the Giants as a kick returner. Uh, and then, you know, the Giants were loaded with wide receivers. Uh, he was there, you know, he, your, your dad had had such a stellar career. He played in some of the most important games in NFL history. And, you know, the one thing that, you know, I, I remember seeing your dad play in the 60s and the 70s. You know, and, and you know, he was just speed and, and just an amazing route runner. Yeah, well, he... He trained, he was way, way, way ahead of his time in his training and the things he did and the way he ran the routes. I mean, he, like, designed, well, like the rounded patterns, the speed cuts. Dad's the one that actually started that and developed it. And that's how he got in a lot of trouble with maybe some coaches. You know, they'd say, hey, run it this way. And, you know, Dad would come back and say, hey, man, how do you drive a car going around a corner 50 miles an hour? Can you do that, Coach? No, you got to slow down, put on the brakes, and go. He goes, I don't want to slow down. I want to just use my speed and just run that route. And when he learned to do that and run those routes that way, um, and, and with Nambus throwing the ball and his anticipation and timing, I mean, it was just it, it was unheard of. Do you think, and, and and I guess I would I would ask this of you because you know I mean you you were around a guy like a Jerry Rice you were around these guys but I mean you you saw a film of your dad like what what kind of effect do you think your dad had on generations to come of wide receivers in the later seventies the eighties the nineties now I mean do you see things now Scott when you watch football that your dad was doing when he showed you that game film of him playing from back in the sixties. Um, you know, it, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, John. <laughs> no, I, you're I, fine. I, yeah. Yeah. I, 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 and this is, and I just got to be honest. I, I had a text come in and I, I was reading it. I, I lost track there. No, no, you're fine. You're fine. I, I can say that again. I, I mean, just, you know, watching, watching that film of your dad, um, and, 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 and seeing guys then come along in the NFL following him. I mean, do you, do you think that he had an effect on the way the game was played for wide receivers as the years went on? Well, I, I think for some of the guys, um, you know, that want to really study the position, they'd go back and research and watch. But um, honestly, even today, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't think they study and they go back. They just kind of – you know they become themselves and and but you know they should that's for sure i mean that's how you learn is from watching guys before you um and and there's still things they could learn today i mean i i know one thing if if i coached the receivers in the nfl i i could teach them a lot of things that they're not doing and it's funny cuz i i've gone to training camps and I've gone to Pro Bowls, and I've watched receiver coaches and certain things, and I'm like, oh, my gosh. Oh, gosh, there's so many more things that they could do, and they're not doing them. Uh, but then they might be doing them with, you know, guys got personal trainers now uh, that are doing certain things. Uh, but but I still feel there's, there's a gift. I, I have some knowledge out there of some things that they're not doing. Well, and, and, and was that unique for you with, I mean, you know, we're, we're talking about your dad like this superhero figure. I mean, when I was a little kid, my dad, who obviously is doing the podcast with me, he always told me his favorite player was Joe Namath, you know. So I know that, that it means a lot to him to be able to talk about, about Don Maynard, the, the, the favorite target of, of Broadway Joe. But, I mean, for you, he was just dad. You know, you said he was just Mr. Maynard to the guys in the neighborhood. Was was that unique, though, having your dad be a guy as big and, like, larger than life as a guy like Don Maynard? Was that interesting to you, or was that something that you never really noticed? No, I I never really noticed it. I, I just – I could see the, the respect of of businessmen or people or neighbors, uh, but it wasn't on dad's football ability. It was his – his helping, his friendliness, his his caring about somebody um, that attracted, um, 
I don't know. He didn't have to be, you know, a football star. He was a a human being star, you know what I'm saying? Uh, which is kind of unique. And he took a lot of pride in in uh, in that, you know. And, and it goes back to the good book, you know, the Bible. Treat somebody how you want them to treat you. And uh, it, it was it was more on that. But then when you are the echelon and the top, in your game, uh, going to the all-star games or with the teammates can see it, and you read the articles on him of coaches saying things that they've seen Maynard do things that they've never seen any other man or player do. Kind of the same thing when Namath came out. It was like every coach in the NFL was like, oh, my gosh, you know, nobody can throw, move, footwork, quick work, release. He was just a phenom. And it was kind of one of those same things uh, with Dad, the way he ran certain routes and patterns and deep ball and his deceptiveness and his change of pace. It was things nobody used that he used that he he just got better and better at it. So do you think do you think that, that 12 and 13, meaning Namath and your dad, do you think they were, like, born to play on the same football field together? I mean, that's... That's kind of interesting, but, I mean, coming up at the same time, they, they were kind of born to be together, weren't they? Oh, no doubt. No doubt. No. I mean, that, that that makeup and match, you know, it's it's like putting a certain engine in a Ferrari. I mean, you, it's got to have the right suspension, the right this, the right that, the right torque, the right build for it to just work, and those two were that way, and – it's 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 crazy if and they could have you know they could have passed so much more and probably just got all kinds of numbers but it wasn't you know the main or name of show i mean there was there was sour there was there was lamons there was Blake turner there was snell there was boozer there was riggins i mean you, you got to get the ball to all these people Yep, they were a well they were a well rounded team. Uh did your dad ever share with you what it was like uh uh being coached by Wee Bubank, who's another Hall of Famer? Well, not not too much uh about that. It's funny, I do have a I, I wrote uh Wee I don't know if I wrote or I got a letter from him when I was in Canada about nineteen ninety three and it was from Weeb Eubank, or I wrote him, and he wrote me back a two-page letter, and I still have it. I need to frame it. Um, but uh, j- just just talking about coaching, and he was like, he was like Scott. He goes, you you have the the greatest football player as a father that could teach you everything you need to know about football. He goes, I, I thank you for asking me, and I could help you. But he goes, you got the, the best right there, <laughs> which was qu- quite the thing of of weed to say about Dad. I, I thought it was interesting. I saw that your dad, after his playing career was over, he, he was a teacher, he was an entrepreneur, and that he also uh, did a lot of charity work, uh, which you sort of alluded to when you just talked about him, you know, the kind of person he was. Um uh, can you talk a little bit about some of the charity work your dad was involved in? Well, when it comes to right when he retired, I remember I would travel with him, even when he was playing in the in the late 60s. Uh, a certain time of year when the season was over, dad had another season in December when he came back. And he just traveled West Texas, Arizona, New Mexico, Oklahoma, and he spoke at high schools, their sports banquets. And I just remember traveling with him, going to all these places. And so that was a big part. And then he worked summer camps, businesses. He was involved in tie companies, transmissions, uh, prices, creamery, dairy, Ferris, slacks, pants, uh, chainsaw companies, home light chainsaws. I mean, the guy was nonstop. He couldn't say no to people. And I think that's one thing that probably drove my mom and him apart and getting a divorce because it was just, it was all, you know, he was doing things for so many people and, and it was like, 
uh, family time wasn't we, he didn't have much family time, and you kind of see that I guess with the deal that happened with the Brady and stuff. I, she wanted family time, he didn't, or spending stuff, and I don't know. I, I shouldn't even gone there because I don't even really know the whole story. But for us, I mean, you know, when Dad was home, he was home. But I don't. I, he traveled so much. Uh, then he went to all these uh, golf tournaments, uh, cancer benefit tournaments. And at home, he was a member of the Lions Clubs, and it, it was just like, I don't know how he did it, honestly. Cause now I'm an adult and see, you know, I'm just involved in maybe coaching, helping with high school football or something at the church or something here and there, and even being doing two things, and he was doing things all the time. Hmm. So That's was, unique. Yeah, he was just a busy guy, busy guy. Yeah. Yeah, you, you mentioned earlier that you've actually worked uh, at Joe Namath's camps. What 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 has it been like? I, I know obviously we know about your dad's relationship with Namath. What what has it been like uh, working with with Joe? Oh, I tell you, Joe and I have had a wonderful, wonderful relationship for well forever. Basically, you could say since 1965, when I was uh, you know three four years old. In the locker room, uh, you know, I, I can, I can, running around in the locker room, seeing Joe and knowing Joe my whole life as a little kid, and then years later, you know, he's got a camp. He had it for forty nine, forty eight years, and I went to it a lot. In the coach, I should have gone to it actually as a player. I go back, and I'm, you know, that that's a question that I'd love to ask my dad. You know, hey, Dad, why didn't you send me to, to Joe's football camp? Because it was full contact, and I could have learned so much. Here in Texas, they didn't allow that. They weren't allowed contact camps um, and just to get that type of deal. But then later on, I coached down in uh, Miami, and I got to see Joe a lot. And uh, then at golf tournaments and the Jet events and the Hall of Fame, and we just got, you know, we got real close. And I knew him and Dad were super close. They talk on the phone like all the time. And uh, but it was neat for for me to be able to to enjoy that closeness of a friendship uh, with with you know one of Dad's teammates. And uh, and, and I got to really experience that with a lot. Uh, Bake Turner, Curly Johnson. Uh, he, you know, I did a fishing trip, golf trip with Curly, and we, and it was just great. Uh, same thing with Bake Turner. I went to Alpine, Texas, and helped Bake build this house barn just out in the middle of the the sticks. And uh, and then of course to see Joe, you know, and and then in the later years, you know, when Dad had his dementia, I would still take Dad to the Hall of Fame, but. I'd had to go with him everywhere, but there's a couple places it was only gold jackets, and I would turn Dad loose to Joe, and and you know Joe would he would sit at Joe's table with him, and um, it was just great that their relationship was just incredible. Yeah, they seem to have. Uh, I saw another film where uh, they were talking about the sort of how they were in sync. You know, they said that they would talk on the sidelines and, you know, your, da- your dad would say, well, hey, I can get open with this play, and then they would go with that. And it just it, that just sort of amazed me to, to hear that. And it, it, it's a common thread because I, I know I, I also talked, I had a chance to interview Zeke Bradkowski, who was, uh, who was the backup quarterback for Bart Starr with the Packers, and he sort of alluded to that too with him and, and Starr being on the same page. It seems to be... I, I don't know that that to me seems to be a common thread for greatness in terms of, of of championships and that type of thing. When I hear that, I hear that common. We we one of the things we've done in our organization is a series of books on great teams, and it's and it's something that I hear over and over again from from players is is you know how they were in sync with each other and they knew what each other was going to do and when they were going to do it, and that that's what caused them to have that greatness. Right. And and you have to have that. And those are the championship teams, the championship players, the Hall of Famers. You know, it's it's a very unique chemistry. Um, and, and it takes, it, I tell you what, every pro athlete doesn't have it. 
there's certain things within them they just don't have. Yes, they have the talent, they have the ability, they have certain things to be a great pro player, but but there's certain guys that just have an instinct and a feeling with his teammates around him, and uh, and and they are the exceptional ones. Did your dad ever share with you uh, memories of, you know, I, I said before that he played in some of the great games in NFL history that are just sort of landmark games like the 58 championship game with the Giants, and then he played in, in the Heidi game. Uh, when I was amazed, because I remember watching the Heidi game, but then I saw your dad had like 10 catches and over 200 <laughs> yards receiving in that game. And then the AFC championship game when he – that he the the pass that he caught late in the game just before the touchdown pass uh, from Namath, uh, which he considered one of the greatest in his career, and then uh, being a decoy in Super Bowl three, and then a game I remember, and I and I don't know if he ever talked to you about it, but I remember seeing him on a Monday night game in 1972 against the Raiders, uh, where Namath threw for over 400 yards, and your dad caught seven balls for over 130 yards. And it seemed to me the whole night I was watching on TV, it was name it to Maynard, name it to Maynard, name it to Maynard. And I remember afterwards, you know, John Madden, you know, just saying, you know, you know, even though the, the Raiders won, you know, just, you know, how impressed he was with those Jet players, you know, and particularly name it in your dad. Did he ever talk to you about some of those great games that he played in? Or was he pretty quiet about that type of stuff? Well, he, he really was. He was really uh... – he he was humble. I mean, he wasn't going to talk football unless I was really going to ask mm-hmm. about it. And even in high school or later on in college, dad dad wasn't that that way. And and it's it, it's funny because I kind of wish sometimes he was the opposite that he pushed he pushed me more and and showed me a little bit more. But he he just wanted me to be my own man and own person and enjoy what I did enjoy. Uh, but you know, yeah, when it was time to talk about the games, he said, son, I played in all of them. I played in the big ones. I played in the, the, the mud bowl, the, this bowl, the, that bowl, the Heidi bowl, the, you know, blue gray game. And he goes, I've got to play in stadiums. Uh, he, 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 you know, the passing games, where even the Colt game, where the Colts and the, I think that could have been 72 also. The Jets and the Colts did like over 800 yards mm-hmm. passing offense. But that Monday night game in 72, that was incredible. That was just, that was one of the best, especially me as a son getting to watch. I've watched that full game and the commentary, which is incredible. You know, uh, Frank Gifford and Frank was one of Dad's teammates, mm-hmm. and of course the, the way even Cosell that they talked about my father. Of course, the record was coming up, and he broke it in that game. And you know, and you know, later on, it's like they were more upset that they didn't stop the game and you know give Dad the game ball and this and that and honor him. And a lot of people just thought it was a, one of the Al Davis, you know, Raider snubs. They were going to let you know the Jets and their stadium have any honor. Well, you know, the thing I remember about that game, too, and it, it sticks with me, uh, you know, that, that game was, my goodness, 1972. That's 50 years ago. Boy, or one of the things that sticks with me about that game was what was amazing about your dad and Namus' performance that night and was is that they really didn't have a running game that night. So they had to pass the ball, yet your dad kept getting open, Namus kept finding him open, and it was just amazing. The Raiders couldn't stop it. It was just, you know, just an, a, an amazing thing. So, uh, yeah, you know, I, yeah, I, it, I, it just it's a vivid memory to me because I, I it's just one of those things that sticks with you. Well, it it really is because the following year that was one of the last games, and then the following year in training camp, uh, that that next year, the '73 season, Dad went in. He actually came in early. And he didn't drop a ball in camp, and and he was released. And I, I go back to that '72 game, and watching Bell and watching, uh, you know, Caster Barkham was there and David Knight, and and basically, 
Don was the guy Joe had to go to. The other guys, I think there was a total of six drops. Bell had two. I think Caster had two. Uh, Barkham, I think he had two, and Knight had one. And it was just like, and and Dodd caught all of them, all eight. And Joe missed them on another go that should have been a touchdown. Mm -hmm. That would have gave him probably over 200 yards for that game. Uh, it was an amazing performance. It really was. Yeah, for for yeah. especially for a 36 year old. Yeah, 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 yeah. Hey, you hey, know, you mentioned one other thing that brought back memories to me too, because we grew up sort of the same time frame. When you said Hutch, <laughs> I remember it seemed like every kid in my neighborhood, me included, had those Hutch helmets back then. So uh, that that you brought back a memory there. That that uh, I have to say, I think we all had that Hutch equipment back then. Yeah, we did. I've got, well, I've got it in my photo album. And uh, and I'm wearing the Hutch uniform and the helmet and the shoulder pads, and it's uh, mine's all Jets, of course. And then my German Shepherd is sitting right next to me, and my German Shepherd sitting and me standing, his top of his head like goes up to my neck. So when I used to run around the yard carrying the little football, and that dog would just tackle me. And it was like that was my first real experience with football and tackle football and i just i loved it <laughs> yeah yep yeah. hey uh scott i guess one last question what what is scott maynard doing today well i am living in a beautiful resort town Riosa, new mexico in the mountains and uh it's it's got a, a mountain here peak of like 14 7 or something and i live at the base of the mountain on ski run road it's called along a creek, and, uh, you know, me and my dad used to come up here to the mountains camping, hunting, fishing, and, and playing golf, and I just fell in love with this place. And, and and when my mom died in 98, I came up here and brought my trailer, my camper, and I found this piece of property, and it was a God thing, you know. I'd just been praying what to do. I I, I, I finished coaching. Uh, I was, I just left Canada and I was taking a hiatus, you know, cause of my mom dying and I wasn't going to coach for a year. And I found this place and dad came up to look at it and I go, dad, I found my place. And, and he goes, son, it's nice. It's 33 acres. And, and there was this 9,000 square foot lodge that sat empty for 28 years and just trash all over the property, but it was beautiful. And I go, dad, this is it. And I need to borrow some money. I had about half of it. And he goes, son, that's, that's a lot of money. He goes, I just, I don't know. I hate to see you throw it away. And I go, dad, what am I going to do with it? I could die tomorrow. And he goes, well, yeah, he goes, I just don't know. And we're standing there having this father-son talk. And there's a ski lift on the property. And we're just talking right there at the bull wheel under the ski lift. And I've never noticed it. You know, I've just been looking at the property for about two weeks and hiking all over this place. And so, so I'm just standing there. And I look up and I go, oh, my gosh, Dad, you see that? And he goes, no, son, what? And he goes, look at that chair. He goes, well, yeah, it's a ski chair. And I go, Dad, the number of the chair, it's 13. And he, I'm getting goosebumps right now, John. And he goes, son, oh, my gosh. And he just started jumping up and down. Oh, my gosh, where, where, where's your money? Where you, you got your Canada and this and that, and you got your annuity over here. And, oh, God, we got to go talk to Bill Pippen. And he's a realtor my dad's known since grade school that's been up here 50 years. And we did. We went and got the plats and hiked and got and and we got it done. And uh, then we built a RV park. Wow! So that's what I I do. Me and my sister and family uh, we run an RV park, and uh, it's just wonderful. And Dad's got to be at the RV park, and they get to see a Hall of Famer. Um, you know, rake pine needles, and back when they would play bingo and ca- call out the numbers, you know, they'd call out the numbers, and my dad's just sitting there going, oh, 32, that's booze. And then they would go, oh, man, it was the funniest thing. That the, 
the the people in the RV park would just crack up, and then he'd go, "Oh, thirteen, that's me." <laughs> Uh, that's a great wow. story. That's a great hey, story. hey, I, I, Scott, I, I, I did have one more thing for you because I've, I've heard you mention this a couple times, but um, did did faith play a big role for for your dad and and for your family and and a lot of this as well? Because I've heard you guys mention mention you've I've heard you mention the Bible, I've heard you mention verses, I've heard you mention God. Did that did that play a big role for your dad and for you and all of this as well? Oh, huge! It was it was the biggest. Um, and dad, when he, when he always, um, would go to his, his speaking engagements and he would always end it with, with love. He goes, that's what it's all about. Love and the Bible and, and, and God and Jesus. And he'd say, we just need to love, love our mothers, love our fathers, our brothers, our sisters, our neighbors. And he goes, young men, he goes, that's what I'm going to tell you right now. He goes, before you go to bed right now, he goes, I want you to tell your parents you love them. You let them know that that you love them. And parents, you tell your kids, let them know. And he goes, because God is love, and God loves you, even though you can't see him. He loves wow. you. He loves all of us. That's powerful. Yeah, yeah. That is, that is. Scott, we we my myself, George, we we appreciate you doing this so much and making time for us and and I'm sure we could talk to you for hours upon hours about stories, but um we thank you for the stories and and thank you for the time and uh, uh hopefully one day we get to meet you in person and and maybe we'll have you, even have you do a PFRA event if possible. Oh, yes, that'd be great. Anytime, guys, just just give a holler and uh and George, John, I appreciate it, and uh, and and your your fan base and everything. I uh, hope they they enjoyed it. <laughs> well, Sounds good. Thank you. All right, much. take care. Have a good one. Bye bye. Hey there, sports history fan. This is Arnie Chapman, aka the Football History Dude, and I hope that you enjoyed this recent episode presented by the Sports History Network, and we're able to learn some good old fashioned sports history knowledge nuggets. I started the Sports History Network. Back in 2020, with the mission to help podcasters find a community of like-minded sports history nerds, as well as helping aspiring podcasters to start their own shows. We have a little bit over 30 shows on the network right now covering all sorts of sports history. But as far as I'm concerned, we're just at the toothpick in the ocean moment. You know that. Can't even figure it out because there's so much more coming. We wanted to create the ultimate headquarters for sports yesteryear starting with Podcast Network and our website, but we're going to continue to move into other mediums as well. And here's the cool part, because we want you to be part of our team. So if you're interested in starting your own podcast, or maybe being a guest on one of our shows, or who knows, maybe even writing an article for us over on the website. Seriously, all you got to do is reach out to us on the contact page over at sportshistorynetwork.com. You can be as technologically savvy as a Neanderthal tapping on a stone trying to figure out this whole hieroglyphics thing back in the day. Again, it doesn't matter, because even if you don't understand the whole podcast space, we have a production team that can pretty much help you out with doing everything. All you got to do, head over to sportshistorynetwork.com, head to the contact page, fill it out. That message goes right to me, and I'll reach out to you as soon as I can. But for now, dude, I'm through if you're through.